Our next question, let me pick one of these. It's from Rob Stovall on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through. Rob, in the future, if you have 50 questions, email them in one email. Do not send 50 tweets. You flooded the entire feed with your questions about Starcade 83. You have stove up our feed, Stovall. Uh, which one of these questions? Uh, I'll just run through them all. One of the iconic images of Starcade 83 is the overhead shot of the light blue ring mat with a bright yellow NWA letter. Excuse me, with the bright let, br- I can't read this shit. One of the iconic <laughs> images of Starcade 83 is the overhead shot of the light blue ring mat with the bright yellow NWA letters, all of which are stained with blood. How were these mats cleaned and how often were they replaced? <laughs> they weren't and almost never. <laughs> Oh, God. No, canvases. Back in, I'll tell you, a a good quality ring canvas back in the 90s was like $750. And we would, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and and more often in OVW, because we had a little bit more money to work with, but at least when I was in charge of a canvas in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, every once in a while, when people started saying, hey, fucking canvas is dirty. We would get the ring guy to go get one of those carpet fucking steamers and stretch it out somewhere and fucking steam it, steam clean it with the carpeting and spray the, you know, anti bullshit on it. Uh, but I guarantee you, I remember times in the Louisville gardens where that ring got set up every Tuesday and that same canvas was on there for months and months and months and nobody fucking touched it. And it got dry and crusty, all that blood and people and dirt and piss and whatever the fuck had happened in that ring. And then finally, one of these days, another canvas would show up on it. And it sometimes it'd be cleaner and sometimes it wouldn't, but it'd be a different one. They brought another one from somewhere or got one. And if, if they didn't get Louisville a new one, then the, the, the other town that had one that was in better shape than Louisville's got brought to Louisville because they got a new one in, in that town. Uh, yeah, it was, it was real hit and miss back in the old days there. But what other 49 questions does he have that we can? You really want me to? I mean, they're all about Starcade 83, uh, seemingly. Oh, oh, he must God. have been watching it. One of the most gruesome moments within Starcade 83 finds Carlos Colon chewing on the bloody scalp of Abdullah the Butcher. Oh, oh. Was there a concern about the <laughs> inadvertent transmission of bloodborne diseases in the territory era? Uh, no, apparently not in that case. And I think the fucking uh, principles of the uh, fucking equation that he was talking about were probably the ones that would <laughs> have not been worried because they probably were the fucking... Perpetrators and, and uh, disseminators of those same bloodborne illnesses. Patient zero. As a, hey, let's get another one of his questions here on the show. We but no, to... no, nobody, nobody thought about that shit no. back then. You know, at that point. Uh, let's see. Uh, he's got so many questions here. At Starcade eighty three, every babyface pledged their support for Ric Flair in his effort to dethrone Harley Race, with the notable exception of Dusty Rhodes. Was Dusty setting up a heel turn for himself? Oh, good lord, no. Probably because he wanted to keep him him and Flair special for the future to where that they could probably say that, refer to that after, well, Dusty never did get behind you there, Rick, or whatever the case. Gene Kaniski, in refereeing the Flair Race Championship match, has his Got hands all in the fucking way. Has his hands all over Harley Race, even dragging <laughs> Race around by his hair. According to the rules of wrestling, wouldn't this disqualify Kaniski as a referee? Uh, no, he, he was trying to show that he was, he was trying to be a baby face really showing that he was trying to restrain race from, from doing these heinous things to flair. So I understand that, but that's an example. Gene Kaniski was a wonderful world heavyweight champion and a great worker, but was a horrible referee. And was just all in the way every, every time they were doing anything, it was just not good. Gene Kaniski refereed the classic match between flair and race at the first Starcade. Do ex wrestlers make better or worse referees? Seems that they could do, de- seems that they could be a great deal of risk in using them. Well, it seems like it seems that there could be a great deal of risk. Yeah, it seems like there's a slight risk of stroke in your family there, pal, <laughs> uh, the way you ask your questions. Yeah, I believe we've just addressed that. Yes. Although Virgil Reynolds doesn't receive a producer credit on the first Starcade, his fingerprints are all over the show. In 1983, what degree of control would Dusty have exerted over creative and Jim Crockett promotions? Uh, none, because he didn't have the job yet. Uh, but it's it's the obviously the famous story that Dusty's idea was Starcade, the concept of the show, and and he had pitched that to Crockett, and was there even though he wasn't the booker and wasn't on the show. He was there that night 
uh, because that was where they were setting up the deal to bring him in as Booker. And that was a big step in those days. Dusty had been booking in Florida uh, for a while, uh, maybe a, uh, on and off a bit. Yeah. But uh, but to bring in somebody to book a territory like the Carolinas, that was a big step. And and he was replacing, I think at, the, at one point they had Dory Funk Jr., but they also had – Johnny Weaver and a couple of other guys really basically booking the Carolinas and each one of them had a state or something. Yeah. Uh, Gary Hart had a piece. Gary of it. Hart. Yeah. yeah. A few guys. So it was, uh, that was a big move, but their business was down. Crockett's was, and uh, several things had changed. He'd lost some key people and he wanted to do something. And, but when I say their business was down, they'd set that, they set that fucking record for the cage match was, uh, slaughter and Cronodal and steamboat and young blood. Uh, early that year, was selling out, turning them away by the thousands from the Coliseum in Greensboro, and then they're at Stargate, which was Dusty's idea, and that was a huge success. But business overall around the territory was not as good as it's been, as as it had been in the past, and they wanted to make a change and establish some shit. And '84 was worse than '83 until all of Dusty's people and his concepts and everything got over, and he got the pieces in the right place. While reviewing Starcade 83, I took note of how Rufus R. Jones's in-ring style resembled that of Dusty's. Oh, for fuck's sake. Strutting, a flurry of punches, followed by an elbow or a headbutt. Was that vintage Rufus, or was he coached by the dream? No, that was vintage jive. <laughs> Excuse me, gentlemen, I speak jive. Uh, no, that was what every... Black baby face it did, and Rufus, of course, carried it to Rufus R. Jones came off the ropes looking like a disconnected bucket of body parts, right? It, 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 his appeal was that people believed that he was him. His promos were unintelligible, but it was, sounded legitimate, and he had physical charisma, and, and you could get sympathy on him, and then he'd make a big comeback. But it wasn't pretty in a lot of cases. Uh, but that was vintage jive ass black baby face comeback shit. And Dusty stole it for for his stuff because that's why he was over with not only the the cowboys and the rednecks in Florida, but all the all the black fans too. He was you know he was stardust. He was for everybody. Dusty is quite conspicuous in his efforts to put himself. Are we over. still asking these fucking questions? Now I didn't mean to make this a goddamn miniseries. The entertainment value is waning. This will be his last one. Dusty is quite conspicuous in his efforts to put himself over during Starcade '83. It may have been billed as a flare for the gold, but the dream kept himself in the spotlight. Would there have been heat over such self-promotion? No, he's fixed to be the fucking Booker. Jesus. And there are your questions, Rob. Few of them, at least. Uh, and next time, <laughs> but, in, but in all in all seriousness, he's fixed to be the Booker, of course, and he's also one of the biggest box office attractions in the wrestling business. So he's headlined, as they say, everywhere from the Tampa Sportatorium to Madison Square Garden, baby. Uh, so yeah, he's he he knows what he's going to do. He's starting it that night. 